Good morning. And it is a lovely morning, and you're looking well, and it's nice to see each one of you here today. We're going to use the words of over a thousand tongues to sing, and we're going to stand to say, oh, just one other wee thing. Uh, A ring was found in the car park, so if you've lost a ring that looks anything like this, uh, it's there, and uh, come and have a look afterwards. Sorry. wakened us up a bit, didn't it? Lovely hymn, and you sing it so well here to the glory of God. Well, let's come before him in prayer. Father, we can understand the hymn writer's sentiment when he thought about praising you and realized that if he had a thousand tongues, it would take a thousand tongues to just utter 
even the least of your attributes, your worth. And yet, Lord, we know that you are one who has many, many attributes. You are a God who is so full that you fill space and time and eternity. And Father, you're a God who is generous and who gives and gives and gives again. And Father, here we are trying to find words to praise you. But Lord, you understand that we are fine, that you understand that we are mortal, that we are limited. And yet, Lord, you accept the praise of our lips if it matches the meditation of our heart and if it's acceptable in your sight. Maybe be those who not just, are not just worshipers in truth, but worshipers in spirit and in truth today. And may we come with that right heart. Lord, we are glad we have an opportunity to come. We're glad there's a place here open for the preaching of your word, the fellowship of the saints, the encouraging the one of the other, and also the uplifting and praise of your high and holy name. May this be today a time that is led by your Spirit, and may we be filled with your Spirit, and may we be those who go out of this place walking in the Spirit. Lord, we ask today that you will help us. We need help as we open your Word. We need help to understand it. We need help to act it out. Give us that help and that power, we pray. We realize that around us there's the power of the world, Behind that is the power of the devil, and within us is the power of the flesh. Lord, we need your power that we might live as you want us to, in a way that pleases you. Father, we thank you that we can open your word and make it simple and understandable to the youngest here today. And we pray that that might be so. Pray that they will be able to take it in, that something will click, something will fall into place, uh, another brick in the wall of their understanding. And may they come to a knowledge of the truth early in life. Lord, we realize that there are many in the fellowship and they're at the other end of the spectrum. They are advanced in years. And with that has come mobility issues and illness and being unable to gather here. And we pray for those who cannot be with us today. Come to them in all their need. Meet their need. Presence yourself with them. Encourage them, O Lord. And may they, even in their minds, whatever state their mind might be, that they'd be able to turn their mind back to your word and to thoughts of a loving Savior. Lord, we think of Hetty today still in hospital. We pray that you will come to her and Drew in a very special way. We think of Victor and his course of treatment that he will have to follow. We pray that you'll come to him and, and alongside that, may your healing touch be upon him. Bless him and Anne, we pray. We continue to pray for Shane's father, Sean, and ask, dear Lord, that after surgery, he will know a good recovery and that there will be good things to hear, not only in the physical, but also in the spiritual. Come, we pray, and work, we ask. Lord, there are many others who have been for procedures in the past week. There are others who are waiting and others who have consultations and tests ahead. And Lord, this is what goes on behind the scenes quite often. And yet each of these dear ones is precious to you. And we lift them up to you today and ask that they will know that the Savior walks with them through this particular journey that they're on. And may they see many tokens of your grace. Lord, we uh, come to you as a group of people here, as an assembly, as, as a, a witness in this area. Help us, Lord. Help us to be those who witness where you've placed us and also as a light in this community. We pray also for those around us who are working in other fellowships, uh, fellowships that are true to your name and to the blood and to the book. Help them also that together we might see a work done for our wonderful Savior. Lord, we come to you also for the plans that lie ahead for the Holiday Bible Club and also as we reopen in the autumn time again with a new program in your will. Help us, Lord, uh, to be able to find the right personnel, to be able to uh, put together the right programs and to do so having spoken to you and acknowledged you and be depending on you. And Lord, may we then see your hand at work. Father, 
We think of the land where we live. We think of those who reign and govern over us. We think of the UK. We think of the people who make decisions. And Lord, we commit them to you and pray for them and ask that we would live to see your power at work, even in high places, and that we would see evidence of this, O oh Father. Whatever way you would display that, uh, we would see evidence that God is at work. Lord, we commit ourselves to you, and we do so with thanksgiving, and we do so in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, boys and girls, we are back to our Once Upon a Time, and it's been a couple of weeks now since you've had to listen to me, but I've got another person I want us to think about today, another story. And I hope that from that story, we might be able to learn some things about God, about ourselves, and God's Word, the Bible. Well, once upon a time, there was a girl who lived in a roundhouse. Who would like to live in a roundhouse? Does anybody here live in a roundhouse? No? Did you never hear your granny saying, I'll give you the rounds of the kitchen? <laughs> no? I never knew that phrase until I moved to this area. And I thought the kitchens were round. No, I didn't. Well, she lived in a round house, and it was a very tall house, a round house and a tall house. Can you imagine rooms like that? No corners. But it was nice and cozy, and it was home. And this is the outside of the round house that our little girl lived in. So what is that? A lighthouse, yes. Anybody ever visited a lighthouse? Yes, a few of you have. Ever, anybody been inside one and gone up to the lantern? Yes, good for you. This is a lighthouse on the Farn Islands, and this is where the person lived that we're going to talk about today. Her name is Grace. Not a lovely name, Grace. Well, if she's living in an island that's just rocks, as you can see. And there's just that one building on it, which is the lighthouse, which is where they live. Guess what they wouldn't have? Any ideas what you wouldn't have? If you're the only house and you're living on a rock in the middle of the ocean, what would you not have? Oh, we'll give you some ideas. You wouldn't have any shops to go to. Imagine. No shops. There wouldn't be any school to go to. Maybe you're thinking that would be great. But I think maybe you got your, a wee wake-up call over the last couple of years when you had to get school at home. And that's what Grace had. She had school at home. Do you know who her school teacher was? Her daddy. And her daddy made sure that in everything he taught her, she was taught the Bible. Isn't that wonderful? No school, no shop, but then there would be no friends, no cousins to come and take over, no grannies to come with their purse open and their sweets, no after school th things that you do, like all the wee things you go to. Who goes to football? Anybody go to football? Ballet? Not common around here, is it? No. And no church. There was no church. But then her daddy again, he would read sermons to them. See, there were no CDs and no DVDs and all, even tapes in those days. But people who preached and were very famous preachers, their sermons would be printed. And sometimes a whole book would be produced full of sermons, and Grace's daddy would read sermons to them. So that was their church. Everything happened around the lighthouse, school, church, and home. There was another island quite close to where they lived. But to get to it, you had to go in a rowing boat. And Grace very quickly learned to row. Now, she also learned to look at the sea, and she knew when it was nice and calm like that, it was safe to row across to the other island. And on the other island, it was just that wee bit bigger, and there was a wee bit of ground, and they were able to grow some vegetables. 
So that was their wee trip back and forward to get some fresh vegetables on the other island. But life wasn't boring for Grace because she had friends who were puffins. And apparently the puffins used to come right in the door of the lighthouse. That's amazing. And look at that wee baby seal, a wee pup rolling around. Isn't that lovely? Well, there were little baby seals at certain times in the year on the Farne Islands. And there were dolphins, bottlenose dolphins, all around Grace. So she had other things that maybe you and I don't have in, in our garden or in our street, or even down at the lock. She had all of these things. But she had a pet duck. It was an eider duck. And uh, anybody here remember things called eider downs? Well, the eider downs were full of feathers from eider ducks, and that's an eider duck. And Grace had a pet eider duck. So we've got to learn a wee bit about her life. But I'm sure there were times when she was inside her roundhouse and she was looking out the window, and maybe she was thinking, I've seen this all before, but here's the wonderful thing. Every time Grace looked out the window, it seemed to be different. The sky was a different color, and that seemed to make the sea a different color. The sea was a different color. It made the sky a different color. And there were clouds going past, and she was able to read what was in the sky and what was in the sea and know if something was about to happen. What do you think she was reading? What do you think she thought was going to happen? What kind of change in the weather do you think she was thinking about? There's a lot of whispering going on, but it starts with the right S, unless your, your teeth are in, in the wrong way. <laughs> Storms. Storms. And that was very important because that's the whole purpose of the lighthouse being there. Because at the top of the lighthouse, there was what? A great, big, enormous lantern. And that's why they lived there, because somebody had to make sure that lantern was burning bright. Because if a storm came, and all those rocks that we saw earlier, a boat could miss its direction, get off course because of the storm, and end up on the rocks if it wasn't going wide enough. So it was important that you had a lighthouse. That's another reason why the lighthouses were built round, so that when the storm would beat, there wouldn't be a flat surface to put pressure against, and lighthouses were designed that way so that they could withstand the storm. And they were all built, of course, on the solid rock. You know, when her daddy was reading her stories from the Bible, I wonder, did she think about the story of the the wise builder who built his house in the rock. I'm sure she did. I wonder, maybe did she think about the, the stories of the storms when Jesus came and calmed the storm? I'm sure she did. But to her, that would be really, really vivid. It would mean much more because she would be in the middle of that. Well, looking out her window, she could get a good view all round because it was also a round house. And she could find a window she could go to and she could go to another window and she would always be able to see right round the lighthouse. Well, she didn't just have her own eyes. They had a telescope. Anybody here know what a telescope is? Oh, dear. Yeah, I thought so, all I. Have you ever looked through a telescope? Is there plenty to see in Carrick? Tell me afterwards. <laughs> Telescopes help us to see away in the distance. And Grace, of course, was able to look out the telescope. Now, she's getting a wee bit older by this stage. And of course, if you're living in the lighthouse, you have to share in all the duties, and that's what she did. She was getting stronger at rowing. And she took her turn to be a lookout. And that sometimes meant in storms to look out 
right through the night. So her dad and her mom and she would take it in shifts to look out the window through the telescope. Well, one night as she was looking out through her telescope, she saw something. What does that look like? It's not a paddling pool. Sure, it's not Alice. It's a storm. And then she looks again and she sees, oh, that wasn't there yesterday. And then she gets a closer look and she sees people on a rock. And she sees a smashed up boat. And she thinks, oh dear, we've had the lighthouse on. But somehow or other, this ship has managed to crash into the rocks and it was completely broken in two. There were 62 people on board the ship and she sees a handful of them clinging to the rocks and the waves and the storms beating the rocks and she just thinks these people are never going to survive. What do you think she did, boys and girls? Nobody know. Did she just tuck her Alice nose? Absolutely right. She and her dad got into the boat, which was a four-man boat. And the two of them rode in the middle of the storm. This wasn't a nice calm day over to the island with the vegetables. In the middle of the storm, they rode over to try and rescue these people. You see, it was just a few years earlier that the Royal National Lifeboat Institution had been set up, but it wasn't called that then. And actually, Grace's brother was a member, but he was on the mainland, and it was so bad that they couldn't launch the lifeboat. And these people were going to die if Grace and her dad didn't do something about it. Grace's mum said to her, are you not afraid? And do you know what her answer was? No, I'm not afraid. I have done this many times. Well, she hadn't really done it in a storm like that, but she was prepared to go with her dad to try and rescue these people. And there they go, and I'm sure it was just like that, maybe even worse, trying to get over to the survivors. You see, that boat had been making its journey up past the Northumbrian coast on the east side of England. And it had an engine on board, but the engine had broken. They tried to go by a sail, but it wasn't strong enough to take them past. And they just drifted into the rocks. Do you know something, boys and girls? Those survivors couldn't save themselves couldn't save themselves. They were exhausted. They were clinging on for dear life, and they needed somebody stronger than them to come and rescue them. Well, they kept going until they got to the other side, and they were able to bring back some survivors, and then they had to go back again and bring back more, and they were able to save nine people in total. Isn't that amazing? Well, through time, Grace was awarded a medal for gallantry, and she became really, really famous. Her name is Grace Darling. Anybody hear of her? Some. And she was so famous that about a dozen famous artists all headed out to the lighthouse to paint her. So the little picture we had earlier was partly a true likeness of Grace Darling. She got money from Queen Victoria. Other donations came in. She ended up being a very wealthy lady. She was like a celebrity in her day. But what she did really boosted the cause of the RNLI, the Lifeboat Institution. It was then that people really sat up and took notice of how important it is. And though it had only been started about 10 years earlier, there weren't very many lifeboats. Now everybody was wanting to get behind the cause of lifeboats. And we have no idea how many thousands and thousands of people's lives have been saved because people got on board when they heard of the bravery of Grace Darling. 
Just four years later, Grace took TB and she was very seriously ill. And even the Duchess of Northumbria, she came along and she said, I'm going to take you in and look after you myself. Not a wonderful thing, a Duchess. She was so famous and people cared so much. But even though she got all that care, Grace passed away. And there's a marvelous big memorial there to her in the church near where she lived on the mainland. In that memorial, there's a girl lying down, and do you know what's lying under her arm? Any ideas? An oar. The memorial to Grace Darling. Well, what can we say about all this? She lived in a house that was built on a rock. Do you know Jesus is described in the Word of God as a rock? Jesus is also described in the Word of God as a foundation. And storms come into our lives, but the worst storm that's going to come is the storm of God's judgment one day. And we need to be sure that our whole life, our whole future is built upon Jesus. She has a wonderful name, hasn't she? Grace. You know, there's many things that we don't deserve. Whenever God looks right into my heart and yours and sees sin in there, and yet he gives us an opportunity to know how we can be saved, how we can trust in Jesus, how we can go to be with him, how we can become his child, how we can have all of the blessings that he gives us every day. We can have all of this from God just because God is gracious, because of God's grace. You know, we have a duty also to reach others. Have you ever thought about that? We have a duty to reach others. And there are people today, and while we are preaching in this service There are people all across our world and they have passed into eternity. They have died. And many of them weren't ready. And there's a challenge for us to go out and to see those, the way Grace saw those people on the rock that day, see them as perishing. There's maybe somebody here today and you're not yet saved. You realize that you're perishing. And that we want to reach you for Jesus. And that's why we want to make these appeals in our meetings. We want to see you safely home. But here's another thing. Do you see when you give your whole life to Jesus and you work for him and you reach others for him, you will get a reward far better than all the things that happen to Grace, even the money from Queen Victoria and being looked after by the Duchess. We'll have a greater reward than that. We'll be in the Father's house forever and ever and walking on streets of gold. But then as we found out, Grace's life was a very short life. And that tells me that we have to do things now. We can't put them off. We have to do things when we can, when we have the opportunity, because none of us know when that opportunity will be our last. And I hope in these wee once upon a time stories, something clicks, something falls into place, and we're able to understand more about who God is, who we are in his sight, and what he wants us to know through his word, the Bible. We're going to sing again, and this time it's, Our God is a great big God. And I think it's a while since we've had this one, and we'll stand as we sing together.
I need to brush up on the actions. As you know, I usually get involved, but I just haven't <laughs> didn't remember them today. Well, we are at our 25th study in the series Ask the Exiles in the book of Esther. It's study number six. And uh, the book of Esther is the only book in the Bible, of course, that doesn't contain the name of God. None of the characters address God as far as the way it's written is concerned. And no divine work of providence is attributed to God by the writer in the story. But yet we know and we can see and we've seen so far the hand of God all over it. And God is at work. We have learned that Esther, the Jewish orphan raised by her cousin Mordecai, had been chosen by King Ahasuerus to be his queen. And because of her, not only her outer beauty, but her inner beauty as well. And we asked ourselves the question, have I something that God could use? Then the next question in our next study was this, can I lose sight of who I am? And we saw that even though Esther entered palace life, she never forgot who she was. We could see that she remembered uh, her background. She remembered the integrity with which she'd been brought up under Mordecai. She didn't lose sight of who she was. And that's a challenge to us as we go into different environments, school, college, different workplaces, and so on. Are we who we are at home when we're in public? And are we those who appear to be something else? Then the next question was, does it matter to me what God thinks about things? In Mordecai's case, the stand he took uh, in doing that came at a cost. It had created a nationwide crisis for all Jews, and Mordecai's action had enraged a descendant of the Amalekites called Haman, who hatched a shocking plan to annihilate all the Jews. Well, Mordecai sees Esther, who's now queen, as the only hope of turning this situation around. And that's when he utters those famous words to her. Who knows whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this, Esther 4 and 14. And looking at Esther's response, we use this question. Am I expecting God to do through others what I could do, because initially she goes, well, do you know, you just can't walk into the king, and she put up some excuses, but then she resigned herself to the task, and that led to our next question, which was, what can happen when I am fully yielded to God? That was what we looked at last week, and we started to see amazing things occur, and we'll see more of them now today. Why? Because Esther was fully yielded to God. It cost her to be fully yielded to God. But she went on with it and didn't look back. And God came in in a powerful and in an amazing way. So today's question is this. Have I any unfinished business? Have I any unfinished business? Now, I'm not thinking of you, woman whose husband started a DIY job and it's still never been done. Although if the cat fits, wear it. But it's a question to yourselves, and we're going to look for the answer here in uh, the life of Esther. So Esther chapter 7, verse 1. So the king and Haman came to banquet with Esther the queen. And the king said again unto Esther on the second day at the banquet of wine, What is thy petition, Queen Esther? And it shall be granted thee, and what is thy request? And it shall be performed even to the half of the kingdom. Then Esther the queen answered and said, if I have found favor in thy sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be given me at my petition. Really what she's saying there is, let my life be spared. I'm sure the king goes, what? Let my life be spared. And he'd be scratching his head and thinking, how is Esther's life in danger? Verse 3 at the end of the verse. Let my life be given me at thy petition and of my people at my request. Or to put it another way, I and my people have been sold to be destroyed. Sorry, verse 4 reads this way. I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. So there's her explanation. She's getting to the point. 
you remember after the first request when the scepter was held out and then the first banquet, we were thinking, why is she not asked for what she's supposed to ask for? Now she has waited. And we'll see the importance of that as it unfolds. But it's at this point she is letting the king know that this is not a petty thing. This is not an unreasonable thing that she's coming here. It's not the same as if they were merely going to be in bondage as slaves. This is annihilation. This is on a completely different level, and it involves her. Verse 5, Then King Ahasuerus answered and said unto Esther the queen, Who is he and where is he that durst presume in his heart to do so? Can you imagine her heart beating at this stage? And Esther said, The adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. Now remember, this is a banquet, just the king, Haman, and herself. Now she said it, and it can't be unsaid. The truth has come out. She has waited. She has taken her time. She has chosen her moment. And it makes me think of the words she said earlier. If I perish, I perish. Well, this is the moment when those words are bound to be echoing in her mind. This is it. If I perish, I perish. Yield it. Can you imagine how earlier on she had breathed a sigh of relief away whenever she got on the royal apparel and stood where the king would see her and waited for the scepter to be, and he held it out. <sighs> wow. Then she said, would you come to a banquet? Just Haman and you and myself? And they came. The king agreed. <sighs> relief. And then he agreed to come to the next banquet on this occasion that we're reading about here. Again, sigh of relief. But now she has uttered the words. Now she has said what we thought she should have said on day one. And she has said these words against the very man that the king had personally elevated into such a prominent position, Haman. She wasn't talking about some obscure person or some enemy, a known enemy. This is the man sitting right there in front of her who just happened to have been elevated by the king. Verse 6, And Esther said, This, the adversary and enemy, is this wicked Haman. Then Haman was afraid before the king and the queen. And the king arising from the banquet of wine and his wrath went into the palace garden. And Haman stood up to make request for his life to Esther the queen, for he saw that there was evil determined against him by the king. The tension would be palpable, wouldn't it? The king hasn't spoken a word in response, but his actions say it all. And Haman sees this. And Haman knows that it doesn't look good for him. I can picture the king pacing erratically up and down in the palace garden, garden and trying to process this situation while Esther and Haman are sitting amongst the remnants of what was a banquet. And the king's thinking, why did it have to be these two people? One, his chosen favored queen, and the other, his chosen favored courtier. Verse 8, then the king returned out of the palace garden into the place of the banquet of wine, and Haman was fallen upon the bed whereon Esther was. Now, verse 7 has already informed us that Haman rose up to plead for his life in front of Esther. So we can assume that this posture is an expression of his desperate pleading, because he's pleading for his life here. Then said the king, will he force the queen also before me in the house? Oh dear. The king sees something very different. When he looks at Haman's posture, he reads that situation very differently. 
And that's something we can all be guilty of, isn't it? We see something and we can read it very differently, jump to conclusions. And the king reads something, impertinence in Haman's actions as he sees him lying across Esther's bed. Regardless now of Esther's accusation of genocide, this picture that's before the king's eyes of Haman prostrated across the, king, the queen's feet, perhaps, is enough to push Ahasuerus over the edge. Because this isn't the kind of behavior that King Ahasuerus will tolerate in his palace. As we look at the whole book and look at everything that we see, we can see the king's interaction with his queen. We can see the respect that he has for his queen over and over. Look at how many times he addresses her, Queen Esther, respect. We can see how outraged he is when it seems that the queen isn't being respected by a man. This is the same king from chapter one to the end and the respect that he shows to Esther. Of course, she showed respect to him. There was mutual respect here. So however conflicted the king was in his mind over Haman's wicked scheme, he is now insulted by Haman's inappropriate behavior towards Esther to the point that he must be put to death. Verse 9, and Harbona, one of the chamberlains, said before the king, Behold also the gallows, fifty cubits high, which Haman had made for Mordecai, who had spoken good for the king. The gallows standeth in the house of Haman. Harbona is saying, look, just look out that window. See that big tall contraption there? It's either a spike for impalement or some other method of execution, but that was designed by Haman for Mordecai. Well, that's enough. Then the king said, hang him thereon. And so they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then was the king's wrath pacified. It makes me think of some words of wisdom that we have in other places in the word of God. For example, Proverbs chapter 26 and verse 27. Whoso diggeth a pit shall fall therein. And he that rolleth a stone, it will return upon him. Ecclesiastes 10 and 8. He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it. And whoso breaketh a hedge, a serpent shall bite him. And whoso removeth a stone shall be hurt therewith. And what you're getting there is an idea of someone who tries to do something in their plan. But the very thing that they plan can turn on them. And God's able to do that. We should be careful, shouldn't we? In our schemes and our devices. Because God's able to turn things around. Not only did Mordecai, in just last week's study, not only did Mordecai get all that Haman had desired for himself. What shall we give to the man whom the king wants to honor? Do you remember? Not only did Mordecai get all that Haman had desired for himself, But Haman is now getting all that Haman desired for Mordecai. Can't you see the hand of God in the book? Chapter 8, verse 1. On that day, did the king Ahasuerus give the house of Haman, the Jews' enemy, unto Esther, the queen, and Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told what he was unto her. And the king took off his ring, which he had taken from Haman and gave it unto Mordecai, and Esther set Mordecai over all the house of Haman. So in these verses, we can see that whatever household property belonged to Haman, including staff and so on, and mind you, it was big because the king had honored him and blessed him and prospered him. So this was a huge estate, really. It was now been handed over to Esther, and she was putting Mordecai in charge as manager. Now, if the book had ended there, we would be quite happy, I think, wouldn't we? 
we would be saying, that turned out well. We would have reasons to rejoice and we could see clearly God's hand at work and his intervention on behalf of his people. But we can't forget something, that at this very moment, all over the Persian Empire, officials in every province still held letters from the king telling them and those in their provinces that on the 13th day of the month Adar, the 12th month of the year, they were to annihilate all the Jews. If you Google to find out the origins of 13 being unlucky, you'll find very, quite recent reasons. But this is the oldest reason for a 13th to have been considered to be unlucky. We're not looking for luck. We have God. But that's one of the, the reasons people cite uh, for bad luck, a 13 being unlucky. If I had to live in a house that had a 13 in the door, it wouldn't bother me. And if I was to get married on the 13th, Jean, it wouldn't bother me, you know. In fact, you'd be thinking he was very lucky he got married at all. There was still that awful cloud hanging over the Jewish nation. Remember how many times in, in the exile story we've read these words, the decree, these words, the decree that could not be altered. The decree of the Medes and the Persians which cannot be altered. And that brings in our question, doesn't it? Have I any unfinished business? See, it all turned out well for Esther. Really well. But there's unfinished business. And sometimes it can turn out well for us. But do we think about others? Do we think of the impact certain things will have and do we think of the perishing of others do we think of others with this cloud hanging over them and us as believers in an assembly here do we think of the many who are perishing around us or do we really just think about it's all right for me i'm all right i'm for heaven but what about the multitudes multitudes who are lost Jesus came into this world to do a work, and he finished it. He didn't leave this world with unfinished business. He finished it, the work that the Father gave him to do. He accomplished it. What about us? Have we stopped short of completing the race of the Christian life in the way that we should have we thrown in the towel over some incident or other? Isn't, isn't that so common amongst believers here in Northern Ireland? They've thrown in the towel. Something happened. Enough's enough. Unfinished business. The Lord's business goes on. You're still needed. Have we been thinking of our own plans lately and not of the Lord's plans? Have we unfinished business? I let the Holy Spirit put his finger on these issues in our own lives. Verse 3 of chapter 8. And Esther spake yet again before the king. She's not holding back now. And fell down at his feet and besought him with tears to put away the mischief of him and the Agagite and his device that he had devised against the Jews. Then the king held out the golden scepter towards Esther. So Esther arose and stood before the king and said, If it please the king and if I have found favor in his sight... And the things seem right before the king, and I be pleasing in his eyes. Let it be written to reverse the letters devised by him and the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, which he wrote to destroy the Jews, which were in all the king's provinces. That would have included Israel, remember. For how can I endure to see the evil that shall come unto my people? Or how can I endure to see the destruction of my kindred? Now, this is what we thought, of course, Esther should have said at the very beginning. But then the story wouldn't have had all those amazing twists and turns. Do you remember? We questioned 
her holding back, but we reminded ourselves before we would judge her too harshly that she had just completed three days of fasting and had asked all around her to fast. And we believed that that was accompanied by crying unto God on her behalf. So God's leading here. But also there's something that has come to mind in, in looking at this, and it's the ingredient that the writer has included, made sure that we got, and it's the ingredient of ignorance, not knowing. Now, it has kept us in suspense and made the story very interesting. Of course it has, but it's an important ingredient. See, none of the characters on their own knew the whole story or saw the whole picture at any point as it played out. For example, King Ahasuerus, throughout most of the story, didn't know that Esther was a Jew. Haman didn't know Esther was a Jew. Haman didn't know that the man he hated so much was Esther's cousin. Mordecai didn't know why he wasn't honored at the time when he avoided a treasonous plot some chapters back. King Ahasuerus doesn't know about the bitter standoff between Haman and Mordecai. Esther didn't know that Haman had erected a gallows for Mordecai's execution. And Mordecai didn't know why Haman was so unexpectedly asked to lead him through the city in an honor parade. Why would it be Haman? So the writer of this book is making sure that we notice that there wasn't one of the characters in full possession of all the facts. Why is that important? Well, it shows us that not one of these characters could have done what they did through their own genius. Do you get it? Including Mordecai, including Esther. None of them could have engineered this through their own genius. And that's where we see God again. You and I don't know everything. And you see, when somebody comes to tell me something and unburden and, and explain a, a thing they're going through, I'm very aware that I'm only ever getting that one person's version of events. Because we don't know everything, but God knows everything and sees everything and understands everything and can process everything. And that's why we need to rely on God, isn't it? That's why we need to lean on him. Truth is stranger than fiction. We have a wonderful book here, full of truth. And it's exciting. Verse 7 of chapter 8. Then King Ahasuerus said unto Esther the queen, to Mordecai the Jew, Behold, I have given Esther the house of Haman, uh, and him have they hanged upon the gallows, because he laid his hand upon the Jews. Write ye also for the Jews as it liketh you in the king's name. That's a powerful thing to do now in this particular generation. Seal it with the king's ring. Well, he'd just been given the king's ring. For the writing which was, is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's ring may no man reverse. Now, they've already got these letters that no man can reverse. And now Mordecai is being given an opportunity to do something. But the king does something very clever here. Verse 9. Then were the king's scribes called at that time in the third month. That is the month Sivan. So there was some time before this genocide was going to happen the three and twentieth day thereof. And it was written according to all that Mordecai commanded unto the Jews and to the lieutenants, the deputies, rulers of the provinces, which are from India unto Ethiopia, and 127 provinces, unto every province according to the writing thereof, and unto every people after their language, to the Jews according to their writing and according to their language. And he wrote in King Ahasuerus' name and sealed it with the king's ring and sent letters by post and horseback and riders and mules, camels and young dromedaries, wherein... The king granted the Jews, which were in every city, to gather themselves together and to stand for their life. So the first decree hasn't been rescinded. To destroy and slay and to cause to perish all the power of the people of the province who would assault them both little ones, women, and to take the spoil of them for a prey 
upon one day in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, namely upon the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month Adar. So how were the Jews to be saved? Through self-defense. The original decree still stood. But the Jews were now to receive every assistance in protecting themselves against its implementation. Verse 13. A copy of the writing for a commandment to be given in every promise was Province was published unto all people, and that the Jews should be ready against that day to avenge themselves on their enemies. A valuable lesson is being taught here in this course of action. Let's don't miss it. First decree had gone out, wasn't rescinded, meaning that death and danger was waiting for the Jews. However, if they heeded the advice and the warning contained in this latest letter, they would survive the onslaught. The responsibility was theirs. Look at the language. Gather together. Stand for your life. Attack all the power of the people who would assault you. Be ready. Avenge yourselves. Makes us think, doesn't it, of Paul's words to the Ephesians chapter 6. The principalities, the powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world. Therefore, Because of this, put on the whole armor of God. And not only that, take up the weapons of the the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer, prayer and the Word. God hasn't delivered us and given the devil a new letter. No, we still have the world, the flesh, and the devil against us. But what God has done is, I'm going to give you every assistance to stand Are you standing today? Are you together today? Verse 14. So the posts that rode upon mules and camels went out, being hastened and pressed on by the king's commandment, and the decree was given at Shushan the palace. And Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal apparel of blue and white with a great crown of gold, with a garment of fine linen and purple. And the city of Shushan rejoiced and was glad. The Jews had light and gladness, and joy, and honor. And in every province, and every city, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had joy, and gladness, and a feast, and a good day. From fasting to feasting, weeping may endure for the night, but joy cometh in the morning. But they still hadn't reached the 13th day of the 12th month. Verse 17, every province and every city, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a good day. And I think this is amazing. Many of the people of the land became Jews. We often forget about that little detail, don't we? They became Jews for the fear of the Jews fell upon them. Now, that was a serious decision for anybody to make. It wasn't like one day getting up and deciding you're going to be a vegetarian. To become a Jew was a pretty serious thing. And it would involve them being welcomed into the fold. It would involve them being initiated into the fold. It would involve them being ritually cleansed in the part of women and circumcised in the part of men. This was a big deal. Verse 1 of chapter 9. Now in the 12th month, so here we are. That is the month Adar on the 13th day of the same, when the king's commandment and his decree drew near to be put in execution in the day that the enemies of the Jews hoped to have power over them, though it was turned to the contrary that the Jews had ruled over them that hated them. The Jews gathered themselves together in the cities throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to lay hand on such as sought their hurt. And no man could withstand them, for the fear of them fell on all people. And all the rulers of the provinces and lieutenants and deputies and officers of the king helped the Jews. What a turnaround. Because the fear of Mordecai fell on them. This is the man with the golden crown on now. For Mordecai was great in the king's house, and his fame went throughout all the provinces. For this man, Mordecai, waxed greater and greater. Thus... The Jews smote all their enemies with the stroke of the sword and slaughter and destruction and did that and did what they would 
unto those that hated them. Here's an interesting thing. In spite of all the warnings, in spite of all the assistance being given to the Jews, in spite of all the fear that permeated the land so that many of the people who would have attacked the Jews decided not to, and many others decided to become Jews, in spite of that, there were still many who hated the Jews. Isn't that amazing? Some things never change. Some things never change. Have I any unfinished business? Well, you know, the old devil still has some unfinished business, and a lot of it concerns the Jews. Don't be surprised at the anti-Semitism and the hatred that there remains today in our world against the Jews. Verse 11 of chapter 9. On that day, the number of those that were slain in Shushan the palace was brought before the king. And the king said unto Esther the queen, The Jews have slain and destroyed 500 in Shushan the palace. Imagine. The ten sons of Haman. What have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now what is thy petition and it shall be granted thee? Or what is thy request further? Now this is coming from him. You'd think she had got enough. But now he's going further still. Honor the Lord, you know. Be fully yielded to the Lord. And there's no telling what will happen. There's no limit on what God can do. If we don't yield to him, well, we're one of the problems, aren't we? Aren't we limiting? Verse 13, then said Esther, if it please the king, let it be granted unto the Jews which are in Shushan to do tomorrow also according to this day's decree. And let Haman's ten sons be hanged upon the gallows, and the king commanded it so to be done. And the decree was given as Shushan, and they hanged Haman's ten sons. For the Jews that were in Shushan gathered themselves together on the 14th day also of month Adar, and slew 300 men at Shushan, but on the prey they laid not their hand. Remember the king had said, you could take whatever spoil you wanted. I thought this was a good testimony. I know it's a wee bit gory and bloodthirsty and all the rest of it. It's hard for us to get our mind around a lot of it. But they wouldn't lay their hands on the spoil. This was self-defense. They wanted that to be known. But the other Jews that were in the king's promises gathered themselves together and stood for their lives and had rest from their enemies and slew their foes, 70 and 5,000 but they laid not their hands on the prey. On the 13th day of month Adar, the 14th day of the same, rested day and made it a day of feasting and gladness. But the Jews that were at Shushan assembled together on the 13th day thereof, and on the 14th day thereof, and on the 15th day of the same, they rested and made it a day of feasting and gladness. Therefore, the Jews of the villages that dwelt in the unwalled towns made the 14th day of the month Adar a day of gladness and feasting and a good day, and of sending portions one to another. And Mordecai wrote these things and sent letters unto all the Jews that were in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, both near and far, to establish this among them, that they should keep the 14th day of the month Adar and the 15th day of the same yearly. And verse 26 says, Wherefore they called these days Purim, after the name of Pur. Pur was casting the lots. That's how they came up with that date in the first place. And of course, to this day, the Feast of Purim is kept. Can you see how important that is to the Jewish people? I wonder, do they get the insights that we get as we look through this book? Well, you'll be glad to know that we've come to the end of this series. But here are the questions again as you leave. Have I something that God could use? Can I lose sight of who I am? Does it matter to me what God thinks about things? Am I expecting God to do through others what I could do? What can happen when I am fully yielded to God? What a story. Have I any unfinished business? May the Lord bless these thoughts to your hearts. And after I'm away and come back, we'll... Consider starting what exile have we left out? Nehemiah. We'll see how we get on with him. And that might work in well with our building work that's going on here.
So thank you very much for your patience uh, this morning. I just wanted to finish that uh, in this one session. Oh, for a closer walk with God, her last song. And it's very appropriate. And uh, there's a, we always seem to look up and see six verses. So we'll maybe go for the first two and the last, please. One, two, and six, standing to sing. <laughs> Father, we are on a journey. We have learned much from the journey of others. Father, we pray that we might take these things seriously, avoid the pitfalls, and learn how to walk in a way that pleases you. We think today of Tim and Becky commencing a new walk, a new chapter in their lives, and we commit them to you. And trust that as we've sung together, their walk might be not just close with one another, but close to God. We thank you, Lord, for the great response there has been already with the little bags that are going to Ukraine. And we think of our brothers and sisters there, those 70 CEF workers, and they're on a journey too. And bless them in their walk with you. And as they reach out. And perhaps in their mind, they're saying, if I perish, I perish, as they reach and help others in that awful war-torn country. We pray that you might come to their aid. Lord, as we part the one from the other, may we not leave this world with unfinished business, but may we see too the things that you've placed in our hands for your glory. And in Jesus' name, amen.